a new chapter is unfolding now. And it demonstrates we are at our real essence, energy. That the world as it exists is not finished and finite and discreet, but influenceable and that we are influencing it at every moment. And that everything is connected and affected by everything at every moment. Fundamentally, we exist only in relationship. We exist within a giant field, and we are part of that field. We also exist in an information feedback system. The zero point field is like a giant memory bank of information, of all the information that ever was, and that we understand and learn by a feedback system that goes on at every moment. The idea that all life is interconnected is an enduring spiritual tradition. Now, one group of scientists think advances in computer technology may help them to prove it exists and react to major events worldwide. And this computer and a small box attached, codenamed the egg, might hold the answer. It was a program that started in about 1979 in the Engineering School of Princeton, run by Robert John and managed by Brenda Dunn. I came in 1980 and spent 22 years there before I retired, doing things that um, <clears throat> sound a little strange to people, but uh, which are actually quite important when we're thinking about consciousness. What happens at the edges of what we know about with consciousness? Is there any real presence of consciousness in the physical world. So we set up experiments to ask that question and got an answer, which is yes. Not a big surprise to people who are interested in spiritual matters, but a terribly difficult thing for most um, mainstream scientists to accept or themselves take any time really to examine. Um, in 1997, I started doing something which turned into what we now call the Global Consciousness Project, which is looking at the entire world in a way. Uh, we're using our same kind of technology we developed in the lab, but now to look at um, a, a kind of non-local consciousness that appears to be um, a real presence in the world. For five years, Roger Nelson has been running the Global Consciousness Project. He collects data from what are called random event generators. 75 standalone computers have been set up around the world. They produce continuous random combinations of numbers that are sent back to Princeton. Nelson monitors the machines, looking for any unusual deviations in the data. REG machines, random event generators, are electronic tosses of the coin. One type of random number generator experiment that's been conducted many, many times, hundreds of times, over the past four decades or so, since around the 1960s, has been a random generator that only produces sequences of random bits, zeros and ones, like, like flipping coins. And you would simply ask somebody to press a button, it would produce 200 bits, and you would ask them to say, well, try to make it produce more one bits than zero bits. And when you take the entire body of, of literature, all of the hundreds of experiments that have been done, you can ask a single question. Did it matter that people were trying to push it towards ones or push it towards zeros? And the overall answer is, yes, it does matter. That somehow intention is correlated with the operation, with the output of these random number generators, such that if you wish for more ones, somehow the generators produce more one. A true uh, coin has a 50-50 probability of being heads or tails. 
and you can't predict it if it's thrown properly. So electronic random number generators do that properly. They flip coins, so to speak, high speed, produce a lot of ones and zeros or a lot of heads and tails, and you cannot predict the sequence at all. Nelson's machines are as close to pure chance as it's possible to get, so a regular pattern should be very unusual. So when they do show up, the team is convinced that something very extraordinary is happening. Dean Radin from the Institute of Noetic Science worked with the project. He also believes that global consciousness must exist. He set up the network of eggs around the globe and thinks they hold the key to unlocking this mystery. They called it originally the EGG for electrogiogram, which is an analogy to electroencephalogram, the EEG. In other words, we want a bunch of sensors around the brain of the planet to see if we can find patterns in exactly the same way that we look at patterns that go on in the brain. The aim is to see if human responses to world events can influence their output. Anyone who works closely with machines knows how temperamental they can be. But how can remote computers without operators interact with human minds? Nelson admits he doesn't know how it happens, but he's certain it takes place. Today, there are over 60 random event generators placed around the world. The numbers that come into the generators during normal random events for global consciousness are just that, random. Several hours in advance of a major world event, non-random, coherent numbers are present. A large spike in the data waveform appears giving a precognition that a major event is about to occur. If um, something like Princess Diana's funeral was bringing two billion people to think about the same thing and maybe feel sadness or compassion together, that we should try to see whether our machines, our random event generators, could detect that, could react to it. So um, in that particular case, I asked all of my colleagues and friends who did the same kind of research, please take data. We had several lines of data in Europe, several lines of data in this country, put them all together, and uh, remarkably enough, or maybe not so surprising if you believe uh, the data from the laboratory experiments, we have a big, strong effect. Um, uh, if you did the same thing a hundred times, you wouldn't see the size of um, change in our REG devices that we saw during the time of the funeral for Princess Diana. The September 6th, 1997 funeral of Princess Diana yielded a major signal in the data. Global compassion following tragedy of major world figures or world loss of life yielded the strongest spikes in the data. New York September the 11th, 2001. The tragedy unfolding will change the world forever. 50 kilometers away at Princeton University, the gauges of Dr. Roger Nelson's EGG machine are going berserk. Before the actual crash occurred, before about nine o'clock, I knew nothing. I was happy-go-lucky. I was writing letters how the world was peaceful, right? <laughs> Well, the world was not peaceful, and already the data, before, the, before I knew anything about it, the data were changing. On the morning of September the 11th, 2001, as the American Airlines flight left Logan International Airport, the computers appeared to do something extraordinary. Four days before September 11th, where the eggs are just doing what they normally do, nothing. They were wandering randomly. And then all of a sudden, on September 11th, there's a trend that takes off, which is extremely unusual. The random event generators began to synchronize, overriding the laws of chance. Could this have been connected to the attacks? We have now five years of data and on two or three of the measures, this is 
this 9-11 uh, outcome is unique. There's nothing else like it in the database. News of the catastrophe flashed round the world, and the world stood in shock. Could this surge of emotion explain the mysterious data? Nelson is sure it does. Human consciousness interacts with the physical world in the form of a random event generator in such ways to change the output. And on 9-11, when the first plane hit, I think that was 8.45 in the morning, the data started changing in an unmistakable way about between 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning. In the case of the September 11th World Trade Center attacks in New York, the REGs measured a warning spike four hours in advance of the first plane strike and continued measuring the ensuing events and public reactions. Deep feelings of compassion enveloped the world and a 50-hour trend ensued in the data, reflecting the profound effects of the event itself. The Global Consciousness Network has scientific data showing similar responses to many world events such as Earth Day and world healing events. Major earthquakes reflect in the data hours in advance of the actual earthquakes, showing that the global consciousness field is not limited to what human beings directly perceive. These uh, generators, random event generators, we usually just call them REGs, sometimes RNGs for random number generators. They're a very standard tool in the armamentarium of hmm, psychic researchers. <laughs> they do a good job. They present a system that's easy to understand and um, one in which it's relatively easy to see uh, something that shouldn't be there. That is, if consciousness changes the way the world is, these random event generators constitute a very sensitive way of um, asking that question. Does my intention to get high numbers result in high numbers? And the answer over years and years of experimentation is that it does. It won't be enough to win at the casinos. They have too big an advantage, <laughs> but it's real. When the O.J. Simpson trial was going on, uh, lots of people are watching television because of the courtroom drama that was unfolding. And uh, Radden uh, intuited that there must be a lot of intention going on at the time when the courtroom drama is strong. So he hired a bunch of psychologists who keep, kept track of the courtroom drama. At the same time, uh, Radden was studying the behavior of random number generators. But then uh, Radden found that whenever the intentions were strong in the courtroom, that's when the deviation of these random number generators from randomness becomes very high. So this is a, an unusual point in human history, I think, in that people knew far in advance that within a fraction of a second, either saying the words guilty or not guilty, something of very high interest would occur, which would attract hundreds of millions of people live. So I figured, okay, this is, we have to do this as an experiment then. We have, I had three random number generators running in my lab, and I asked a colleague to run a generator in Amsterdam and another in Princeton. So we ran the generators, afterwards evaluated the results, and sure enough, we saw a, a spike with odds of a thousand to one at, at the, for actually two places. One was when the camera switched from outside the courthouse to inside the chambers. There was like a huge rise of attention, which was reflected in the random generators. And then at the moment that the verdict was read, there was this large spike of coherence in all five generators at once. So this was taking an idea that we had seen in the laboratory and scaling it up to the world at large, and it appeared to work. This leads naturally to wonder, do people, are people affecting the world of reality that they see? You betcha they are. Every single one of us affects the reality that we see, even if we try to hide from that and play victim. We all are doing it. Modern materialism strips people of the need to feel responsible. And often enough, so does religion. But I think if you take quantum mechanics seriously enough, it puts the responsibility squarely in your lap. In the new view, 
Yes, mathematics can give us something. It gives us the possibilities that all these movements can assume. But it cannot give us the actual experience that I'll be having in my consciousness. I choose that experience. And therefore, literally, I create my own reality. It may sound like a tremendous bombastic claim by some new age without any understanding of physics whatsoever. But really, quantum physics is telling us that. So this is the human brain that you probably have seen on many occasions. But in actual fact, that's not the real human brain. The human brain is alive. And if you measured it, this is what it would look like. Those flashing patterns you see there are the actual activity of a real brain. We've taken an EEG, quantified it, and we can actually see the activity taking place over the left and right hemispheres, the yellow and the red that you see is effectively what's going on as a person is sitting quietly. There's microstates going on here, being recreated every 20 milliseconds, 50 times a second. There are about four basic microstatic patterns, which are the building blocks to consciousness, just like pairs, sets of DNA, or base pairs are the information for the last three billion years of genetics. Person's quiet. So the question is, suppose you have had access to information within every other person's brain, and they had access to yours. What would happen? Has it happened? Can it happen? And what would it mean for the future of human societies? No more secrets. And tonight, that's exactly what we're talking about. Suppose you had access to the information of every other brain on this planet. No more secrets. Are we all connected? And the answer is yes. We are all immersed in the Earth's magnetic field. The human species is about 7 billion conductive brains all sharing this field. Think of 7 billion wires all immersed in the Earth's magnetic field. This field contains enough energy to store the experience of every human being who has ever lived. It's an easy calculation. Just think about that. All the information of every human brain that's ever lived has the potential to be stored in the Earth's magnetic field with lots of energy left over. There's the Earth's magnetic field, as you've seen it on many occasions. In fact, the strength of the magnetic field induced in every brain, right now you're being induced, to put it this way, you're immersed in the Earth's magnetic field, is penetrating through your brain, through your body. And in fact, the strength of the magnetic field induced in every brain by the Earth's magnetic field, when all brains are considered, is almost identical to the strength that each brain generates. Your brain generates in the order of about a a picotesla, which is about a, a trillionth of a tesla, much weaker than the Earth's magnetic field, but that's the operational intensity. But what does it mean? It means simply this. Such convergence produces the conditions that allow global resonance and the possibility of a human hologram. That is, seven billion brains, basically immersed in the Earth's magnetic field, all with similar intensities, the whole equal the sum, and the sum equal the individual, individual equal the sum, that sets up the conditions for a hologram. Calculations suggest that the time required for an event one in one human brain to diffuse into all other human brains on this planet would be about 10 minutes. And it would recur primarily during dreams or during altered states. In other words, you can actually calculate it. Seven billion brains is an easy calculation. One brain, something you're thinking about right now, how long would it take if we're all connected to diffuse to every other human brain on this planet? About 10 minutes, and optimally during dreaming, when the right hemisphere is dominant. So here's how it would look in terms of an animation. Effectively, there's the representation of the 7 billion brains, almost 7 billion. And ultimately, this connection would take place over time in roughly about 10 to 15 minutes, particularly if you were dreaming, because there's something very different about the right side of the brain, the right hemisphere. Now, has there been evidence that such connections occur? Yes, for decades, verified cases indicate that some people's sudden experiences about a crisis to or death of a loved one occurs on days when geomagnetic activity is quietest. The experiences usually occur during a dream state. Let me give you an example. On the evening of the 5th of January, I was visiting. This is from a middle-aged woman. This is one of many cases. These kinds of cases have been recorded certainly since the 1870s. Massive booklets containing uh, this information. 
On the evening of the 5th of January, I was visiting in my kitchen with some friends. Suddenly, I felt my face flush and I felt ill. In a matter of minutes, I was out cold. My friends carried me to the living room and placed a cold cloth on my head. They said I opened my eyes and stared for 15 minutes. When I came to, it was exactly 10.30 p.m. That night, I was ill and vomited several times. I kept crying and thinking about my sister. Every time I thought about our mother, I felt depressed. The next morning at 7 a.m., my mother called. She was crying and extremely upset. She told me that my sister, who lived 200 miles away, had died suddenly the night before at exactly 10.30 p.m. Now, that's a classic one. Now, when does it take place? Well, usually it takes place when the geomagnetic activity is less intense. This is an example of a geomagnetic uh, pattern recorded right here in our laboratory at Laurentian University. You can see the perturbations. This is a very active kind of night, a geomagnetically active kind of period. You're looking at various components here. On the other hand, on quiet nights, which is the next one, you can see the difference. In other words, when it's quiet, when it's geomagnetically quiet, the connections between all seven billion brains have greater possibility. When there's more perturbation, it's like having more noise in the system. Very weak effects, but very strong and emotionally significant impact. Classic example comes from an experimental study. Remember, the most important philosophy that human beings have ever developed has been science and the methodology of science. The most powerful and potent tool has been the experiment. This is an experimental kind of study in where individuals who are dreaming in one room and simply engaging in ordinary dreaming in another room, a person is looking at a picture, a target, a picture. And what we find, and this is the work done at the Maimonides Dream Hospital, or dream studies, what we found is that when individuals are dreaming and someone in another room is looking at a picture, under certain nights, when you look at the dream content, is exactly the, what the picture was, the person, the other person was looking at. And it's so obvious that not only does the dreamer know, but if you gave the description of the dream and a series of different pictures and said, pair the dream content with all of these pictures, they'll pick the exact picture that was being concentrated upon. Notice that the black circles indicate that when the geomagnetic activity was quiet, very, very quiet, that's when the dream content of the dreamer corresponded with the details of the picture upon which the other person was concentrating. Well, think about that. Every time you sleep near someone, are they influencing your dreams? Or at a distance, for that matter. But those are correlational studies or experimental studies. Here's a more important question. Why don't these experiences occur more frequently? Or is your brain more like a television remote that is randomly changing channels and ever so often overlaps with the source? What would happen if a procedure was developed that allowed direct access to whole information, to all of it? All right. Suppose there was a technology, and that's what we're talking about tonight. Can the ability to access information at a distance be trained? And the answer is yes, it is, and we've trained it. One such person is Ingo Swan who helped develop the phenomenon of remote viewing. Ingo Swan is the individual, and this is Ingo. Ingo Swan was involved with the development of this remote viewing for the Central Intelligence Agency for the United States many years ago. In the 1960s, the U.S. government was losing a lot of its top secret information, and they couldn't find out how. Well, through a quirk of fate, actually, uh, they found out that it was because the Russians were using psychic spies. Well, everybody had a good laugh over that. But then somebody reminded them, yeah, but they're getting our information. So they wisely decided that if the Russians have it, and if it's working for them, then maybe we'd better look into it. The use of remote viewers goes back more than two decades to the dark days of the Cold War, a time when intelligence reports suggested that the Soviets were trying to turn psychic phenomena into the ultimate weapons. It appears to have been a watershed in the Soviet research, and I say Soviet because it wasn't just Russian, it was Georgian and other nationalities. And prior contacts between unofficial Soviet citizens and the West dried up, and the whole program appeared to go uh, classified, hidden from view, and was 
presumed to be funded either by the KGB, the military, or some other, quote, governmental uh, interest. There was evidence that they were particularly active in uh, long-distance telepathic communication, also in PK that they call telekinesis, and possibly in telepathic hypnosis in order to disrupt individuals in key positions or handling sensitive equipment. Multiple laboratories were involved. They were screening uh, civilians for uh, natural talent, uh, if you will, uh, employing uh, psychics and healers and things of that nature in a wide variety of experiments. Well, one of the things reported was that they were actually talking about attempting to induce death, uh, physical illness, and things of that nature. To catch up with the Russians, the U.S. intelligence community turned to Stanford Research Institute in California. SRI, as it was known, was America's second largest think tank, with more than $70 million in government funding annually. It often dealt with high-tech, defense-related projects, and so it seemed like a good place for secret work on something as unusual as this. A respected SRI physicist, Hal Putoff, got the program started. Uh, I was working at, at SRI uh, on lasers, and I uh, had an avocational interest in, in this field, and so I had carried out some initial experiments on, on kind of a lark. I was actually interested in the possible physics behind it. And so I circulated the results from those early experiences around, experiments around, and uh, pretty soon we were approached by representatives of various uh, government agencies who, who were interested. We agreed to do it, uh, thinking again it was just going to be a small scale effort, not realizing it would take up the next, uh, whatever, 15 years of my life. In the fall of 1972, the CIA gave Hal Putoff $50,000 to find a psychic technique that could be demonstrated reliably, and if possible, used operationally. Putoff soon focused his efforts on extrasensory perception, as the area most likely to produce results. If psychic perception could be made accurate and reliable, then whoever possessed it could be the perfect spy. So they formed a contract with a research group at Stanford Research Institute International to find out whether or not intuition can be used for espionage purposes for spying. Come to find out it can. The researchers at Stanford settled on a methodology called controlled remote viewing uh, invented by a man named Ingo Swan. Uh, Ingo Swan was uh, a well-known, quote, psychic. And so he was one of the first people that uh, came to our program. And so we started out doing what anyone else would do. We hid things in boxes. We hid pictures in envelopes. And after a few days, uh, he got bored with that. And he said, uh, why are you having me do this? You want to know what's in the box? Open it up. You want to know what's in the envelope? Tear it open. I mean, this is a trivialization of, of this ability. Uh, what I can do is I can close my eyes and see anywhere in the planet. Why don't we, why don't we look at that? Frankly, to mollify him, we, we said, okay, well, well, we'll do some experiments. How do you want us to do this? And he said, well, just pick coordinates, latitude and longitude off the map, and I'll tell you what's there. And so we got good descriptions of mountains and lakes and so on, and uh, so we thought, well, maybe we have a case of eidetic memory here. He's memorized the globe. So we got coordinates of more specific things like actual buildings and, and so on, lakes in the middle of large land masses, uh, little bits of land masses in the middle of large oceans and so on. And that continued to work, apparently, to a point that we decided may maybe there's something to this, and so we should take it up. If the viewer would be physically at the site of this coordinate, the viewer would begin to experience the sensory surroundings. And these just poured out like water out of a bucket. You can make long lists of them. And in many times, you can understand what the site must be simply because of these stage two responses. Then we discovered that when that was enough done, that the, 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 the natural system in us begins to describe sizes and shapes and heavinesses and qualities and things like that. And so we call this dimensional contact with the site. And this is where you see they suddenly depart from writing down words, saying it's cold or hot or so forth and so on. They begin drawing pictures of it. As opposed to saying it can't happen, suppose we say it does happen. You realize, let me ask you this. If I told you 200 years ago that I had a device 
that I could put to your ear and you could hear what was going on on the other side of the Atlantic, you would say that's crazy. But now we call it a telephone. Right? If I told you 400 years ago that I had a device which allowed me to measure and represent your friend and I could play it back long after he was dead and you could see that person, you would think it was magic. That's called filming. That's called a video. So think of it this way. Suppose there is a technology that allows us to have access to every bit of information that's available in the geomagnetic field from all of your brains. That's what he did. Well, let me show it to you. He learned to identify experiences that originated primarily in his right hemisphere as pure images and experiences. Here are some examples. While he was sitting in a closed chamber in our laboratory here at Laurentian University and asked to draw what experiments experimenters were seeing based upon random selection of targets. So here's what we did. We had uh, experimenters walk by a hallway and we would randomly give them uh, uh, an area somewhere within 15 minutes of uh, Laurentian University. They had 15 minutes to get there. They would simply look at the target. These were randomly selected targets. Let me give you just a few. This is where you begin drawing. Curved building, tall vegetation, angular, natural, breeze, cool, convex, motion of some kind, a sense of vista, a smokestack in the distance, arena, trees, sense of a conveyor, smell slightly bitter. Now what I've done here, I've simply typed out what he's, what he's written down. He was an artist, he was a post-mortem artist as a part of his training. Car, more than one, slight slope, grotto, mine, entrance to, round and large, distant stack, road. Now don't forget, he's sitting in a chamber now, and we're measuring his EEG. And we've enhanced his capacity with the technology I'm going to show you in just a few minutes. All right. Two major cuts near a closure, depression, circular, something goes in, motion or movement, conveyance motion cars. And what was the target? You all know what it was. The target was the experimenters had gone to see Science North. There's what he drew. That's what it looks like. He had no idea what was going on. These were randomly selected targets. I'm showing the ones that are most conspicuous or many others. Here's a bird's eye view. This is all published in scientific journals, incidentally, and you can access them by simply Googling it on the web. Another target was a Catholic grade school with lots of windows, stalls for bicycles, a figure eight shaped inside hall system, and a consistent pool of water along the edge of the property. Here's how he started. He had no idea. Remember, this happened on several days. And even the experimenters didn't know where they were going until they opened up the envelope outside the laboratory in the parking lot. And then they had 15 minutes to get there. Okay? Tall, sense of massive. Windows, reflections, stones, hear water, pool. People walking, a sense of business, glass, bars, several of them, those bar type things, buildings. Glass, throwaway slope, colors, not glass. Now the bars he's talking about are like bicycle type things, where you put in bicycles. And of course, he concludes it's something like a church or a school of some type. Remember, he's not from around here. He has no idea what the target is. But it's even more than that. If randomly selected photographs, particularly with emotive and meaningful components, were placed in another room, on a table, in envelopes, he could draw the details. Okay, so in other words, what we had effectively in another room, there's a table, roughly 100 different pictures and envelopes, randomly selected, one laid down. He's still in the chamber. We're measuring his brain activity. And he begins to draw. Here's one for you. Deep feelings, and I've actually, this is the actual words that type larger so you can see them. You can see his pictures. Dark but airy, undulating like a boat, watching, gloomy, stars, clandestine romance. I'll tell you about that later, <laughs> okay? Actually, it turns out in that table, on that table, two graduate students had had, how shall I say it, interesting intimacies. <laughs> Feeling of points or seeds. Struts, electricity, feeling of awesome. What could possibly be drawn like that? The answer is the target, a tornado. How close can you get? 
Other ones, for example. This is one of the hidden pictures, and this is what he drew. World not responding, a wash like a tunnel, morose, impact, hatred, into depths, police. This was a terrorist explosion of an airplane. And notice something very interesting. That even down to the components are being drawn. Next. Even abstract ideas. Remember, the whole point is to have a technology which allows access to every bit of information that every brain on this planet has. And this is, this is a picture really abstract looking. Take a good look at those garbage cans and a number of other things. And look what Ingo Swan drew. People, dull target, wilderness like a window. Even something as abstract as that, details come through. Now, I want you to think about something, and that's the following. Just remember Alexander Graham Bell, the first time he generated a signal across the room. It was scratchy. He could barely hear it. But the point is, from that beginning of just a bit of information, now we have one of the most sophisticated technologies in the history of Western civilization. We have the telephone communication system. You've got to start somewhere, and then you perfect the technology. They developed it into a viable military application. And once they did, a long series of projects started, which uh, the public now knows as Stargate. From 1972 to 1997, during the Cold War, the CIA funded what was known as the Stargate program to test if remote viewing could be used as an intelligence tool. The very first, I'm not talking about one out of a hundred, the very first Soviet facility we looked at uh, was over in the Soviet Union. And it turned out our remote viewer, Pat Price in this case, drew a picture of a crane. And he said, uh, I'm lying on my back on top of a two-story building and this crane is rolling over my head. And it's so large that a man is only half a wheel height. Well, when he told me that, I, I thought that was ridiculous. But in fact, it turns out that's exactly what the site was like. I don't know if you can see here, but... Uh, in fact, that little dot there is a man. And so when we ask him, well, what do you think the site is used for? He said, well, I think it's for some space application. It was only after the Cold War was over and people from our country got to visit the location, we found out that, in fact, this was for a space application. old-fashioned theory was that remote viewing had something to do with the brain, sending and receiving electromagnetic brain waves like a mental radio transmitter. And so one way to attack that is to do experiments over longer and longer distances, and we eventually did experiments over continents and didn't see any degradation of the apparent, quote, ESP data. So distance didn't seem to matter, so that seemed to be a strike against the electromagnetic idea, the brainwave idea. We then put people aboard submarines, took them down to the bottom of the ocean. There's enough shielding of electromagnetic waves in seawater, conductive seawater, that that should have blocked it out. In fact, the remote viewer said, oh, this is, quote, psychically quiet. I can do better than ever. So the question eventually emerged, so you can see the building from the outside, how do you get inside of it? You can rerun the whole process through a different whole schema of dimensional contacts and sketches and things, and you can begin to say, what's inside? You can go, you can have the monitor say, move 50 feet underground, and there you are. In the spring of 1973 came a turning point. Hal Putoff told the CIA about the new technique, and they quickly put him to the test. An agency official gave put off the coordinates of a target about three hours drive from Washington, D.C., a target that didn't appear on any map. It was a colleague's vacation cabin in the Blue Ridge Mountains. As it happened, the coordinates were slightly off, and Swan ended up focusing on something else nearby, something much more interesting. Hal gave me the coordinate, and I said, well, you know, there's really nothing here but a bunch of trees. 
So he said, well, look around and see what else there is. So I did my dazzling work on that and looked around and finally drew a map, uh, a simple map of some buildings enclosed in a fence and so forth and so on. And it, it was a, sort of a strange map because there was a very outstanding curved roadway that went around and there was a flagpole with an American flag on top of it. And I did say I thought it was a classified military installation. Putoff gave the same coordinates to another psychic, a friend named Pat Price. And Price also described what seemed to be a classified military installation. He came up with even more detailed information than Swan had. We generate a lot of description and uh, walking through uh, buildings, reading name tags, uh, looking in file cabinets, describing the general layout and so on. By the remote viewer's own description, they felt that they had stumbled on some kind of military site. And, um, you know, that maybe they were actually reading the names of officers, uh, projects, and so on. Because the site Swan and Price had viewed was indeed classified, SRI have never revealed exactly what it was. But I managed to get hold of the original coordinates and found, deep in the mountains nearby, evidence of some kind of secret government base. Eventually, I found a vantage point on a distant hilltop, and through the haze of a summer afternoon, the base was visible. It matched many of the remote viewers' descriptions, and it turned out to be a satellite eavesdropping station run by America's super-secret National Security Agency. Hardly surprising, then, that Hal Putoff is still guarded about the results. And apparently it was uh, quite a good result because um, <clears throat> we were asked to uh, do a lot more, and then at beginning at that point, we began having people show up from various government agencies to participate in remote viewing themselves. The client agencies included the CIA, the Navy, and the Defense Intelligence Agency, known as the DIA. The program received a blow when Pat Price died in 1975, but Ingo Swan remained, and other remote viewers joined the ranks over the years. In 1978, a multi-million dollar remote viewing research and development program was begun. Headed by the DIA, the program was codenamed Grill Flame. The U.S. Army played its own strong role in the remote viewing program. Anyway, at the uh, end of these projects in 1996, the CIA effectively declassified the fact that the government had been using controlled remote viewers for collecting intelligence. Once that became public knowledge, then the science which never was, by the way, uh, classified, what became available to the public. When the information became public that the U.S. government had used remote viewers for uh, espionage purposes and that it was scientifically acceptable, psychics of all kinds decided this is scientifically acceptable and so we're going to start calling what we've always done remote viewing. And uh, immediately out across the internet you started getting remote viewers of all different kinds who uh, basically had no idea what remote viewing was. Remote viewing is a science, nothing more. Um, basically you might use the analogy that if being psychic is a vacation, controlled remote viewing is the car that gets you there. Uh, it's not going to give you more scenery once you get there. It's just a tool. It gets your uh, intuitive ability to be put to use in a controlled, organized fashion and allows you to use what intuitive ability you have. There are a lot of people out on the internet saying that if you take remote viewing courses from them, it'll make you psychic. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's a tool. Whatever psychic ability you have, it will teach you how to use it. A lot of people are surprised at what abilities they do have, but it's a tool. That's all it is. There is no magic. It will not make you psychic. It's a tool and it's a science. So the major area that we're looking at actually is 
has to do with the fact that although empty space appears to be empty, quantum physicists know it's not really empty. It's uh, full of what we call quantum fluctuation energy or vacuum energy. Hal thinks there is a mysterious energy pervading all empty space in the universe, including the cells of our body and our brains. He calls it vacuum energy, or zero-point energy. It might connect us all, in which case it might explain remote viewing. It's our liquid nitrogen tank. You know, the reason it's called zero-point energy is that even if you were to cool the universe all the way down to absolute zero, where all thermal motions get frozen out, this energy still exists. This is a special talk for me because I have spoken about the science of remote viewing uh, in international venues uh, and uh, in university settings uh, around this country and the world. And in each of those presentations, I focus on a particular aspect of the remote viewing phenomenon. Today is interesting for me in particular because I'm tying together things that I have not been able to tie together before. In specific, I think I understand why the remote viewing phenomenon works. And it is directly connected to quantum mechanics, and I'm going to explain my theory about why that actually does happen. And so when we understand the process and its reality, we really come to an understanding not just of the nature of physical reality being different, but the lessons we have learned from remote viewing can teach us a great deal about the history of our own civilization. So I am Courtney Brown. I'm the director of the Farsight Institute. I consider that the leading science shop anywhere where we studied the phenomenon of remote viewing as it is performed using procedures that were developed by the United States military and used for espionage purposes or methodologies that are derivative of those procedures. I work with people such as Glenn Wheaton, who is director of the Hawaii Remote Viewers Guild. Uh, he is out of Special Forces Intelligence. And Lynn Buchanan, who is the leading instructor of controlled remote viewing, and he worked out of Defense Intelligence Agency. And they have trained a large number of viewers, and those viewers work in our experiments that we conduct at the Farsight Institute over a great many years. So let's begin with some basic facts that I'm going to be talking about. Remote viewing can transfer information across both time and space in apparent violation of the accepted theories of Newtonian and relativistic physics. Now, information is physical. That's not in dispute. We normally think of information as just stuff we know, but that's not what information is. It's called information theory, and it's been well accepted in physics and other realms. Uh, it was originally developed independently by, by Norbert Weiner and Claude Shannon, but basically information is equivalent to mass and energy. And there's been a thought experiment for a long while in which one was able to transconvert information into energy. And it has recently been actually performed in a laboratory. So they actually have been able to transform, convert information into energy. Now this scares physicists a lot because if you're transferring information across time and space, then what you're actually doing is the equivalent of transferring energy or mass across time and space. And that's really interesting because it really is in violation of what we know about physics uh, in, our, in our current paradigms. Now, let's make a conclusion from that. First, transferring information across time and space must be, if we're to generalize, it must be a general feature of reality. We cannot say it's an exception to reality. There must be something general about it that we're not understanding that we can generalize and say it's a statement of reality that incorporates that. Also, the past, present, and future must exist simultaneously. For example, a remote viewer is working in real time, remote viewing something under totally blind, squeaky clean conditions that's in the past. Well, that has to exist when the remote viewer is doing it, otherwise the remote viewer could not do it. So whatever theory we do come up with, we must be able to say that that past, present, and future occur simultaneously. Now, there must be some mechanism that prohibits or inhibits us from perceiving the past or future in our normal awareness. So something is going on in our minds where we don't see what was happening yesterday and we don't see what's happening tomorrow. We see only the now, okay? So we have to be able to figure out what that could be. Now, let's start with some basic non-conflicting assumptions. The first is that only energy exists. Now, C, the speed of light is a constant. C squared is a constant. So it's basically just a scaling factor. So energy equals mass. So energy and mass are equivalent. Now, all energy can be defined in terms of frequencies. 
all that exists in the universe must result from frequencies that coexist in states of superposition. Now, I'm going to explain that a little bit later, but those frequencies are all that's out there, anywhere. And those frequencies have to do something with themselves in order to produce us. And it's that state of superposition that that thing happens. And we have to say that there can be no special consideration of the macro world as isolated from or separate from the quantum world. We cannot live in a world in which what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. We can't live in a world in which there's an imaginary line of decoherence and what goes on in the quantum world stays there and what goes on in the macro world and the classical world stays here. We have to generalize so that it incorporates both. Those are the assumptions that we want to be able to start with. If we're going to get someplace, we have to, we have to get those things answered. So let's start with the picture on the left. Picture on the left has waves that are in sync. That means the peaks of one wave is matching the peak of another wave. Now, the trough of, the right, of, the, of each wave are also matching. When you add them together, they sum up together and produce a bigger wave. Now, on the right-hand side, you see that the waves conflict. So what you have is the peak of one wave matches the trough of another wave. And what happens is they're, conf they're conflicting and canceling each other out. So on the left-hand side, we have constructive interference, where they're amplifying each other. They're summing together. On the right-hand <coughs> side, we have destructive interference, where the things are canceling each other out. Now, those are the only two processes which we are going to allow in the entire universe for this theory. Nothing else. These are some sine waves. Now, I just put these sine waves together. They're actually banded around a, a common uh, wave number, similar frequencies. And what you see here is what happens when you add those things together. You get that. You get a wave packet. Now, normally you can think of these things, these constructive and destructive interference patterns, in the following way. Go over to a piano and bang on middle C, and then bang on B right next to it. You'll hear the beat frequency, wah, 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 wah. Now, bang on C again, and then pick the highest B you can get on the keyboard. You won't hear that beat frequency. There actually is constructive and destructive interference, but it's nothing to write home about. It is nothing to write home about. The frequencies really to really interact in constructive interference, they really should be fairly close. That's why physicists like to take a common wave number and then go a little bit out to each side to group those things into a superposition. Now, that is a wave packet. This talk and my theory is very closely aligned with Hugh Everett's ideas that were basically published in his dissertation in 1957 that he did in Princeton under John Wheeler. Now, the basic idea is that all that exists, exists in relative states. So you have stuff that goes on in a subatomic particle, and that produces a superposition, a bunch of waves adding together, and that wave is like a snake. You see, a snake eats a rat, and when that rat gets eaten by the snake, it produces a bulge in the snake. And that bulge in the snake is, well, the snake is like the fabric of reality, and that bulge is like a bulge in the fabric of reality, and that is the superposition. So, Basically what we're talking about is that when you have that quantum particle creating that superposition, physicists have long stated those superpositions, superpositions can happen anywhere, anywhere in the electromagnetic spectrum. But Hugh Everett came along and said, well, you actually get relative states. You don't really have an external observer that's independent from an isolated quantum system. That observer, when that observer watches that, and as John Wheeler said, uh, nothing really happens in the quantum world until it's registered, observed in some fashion. And when you actually observe that, that person becomes part of the overall stuff. So you don't have anything that's really isolated. You have a wave function for the superposition of the quantum particle, but you then you also have a wave function for the observer and the particle. That means you also have a wave function for the building that the observer's in with the particle. And then you have a wave function for the Earth, and you have a wave function for the solar system. And yes, there is a universal wave function. So what you have is relative states. The terminology, the real problem, if there is any real problem with Hugh Everett's stuff, is that the terminology was not sexy. So the idea of relative states didn't really catch on in the terminology, but the mathematics was really solid. And if you look in physics departments these days, that's where the real rage is. The real rage is not in, wow, the Copenhagen interpretation is great, the collapse of the wave function. What we really have is the excitement in the discovery that Hugh Everett stuff is really now. And so what you have with the understanding of the wave function is better described in my view, not in terms of the words relative state, although there's nothing wrong with those words, but 
I like the words superposition ensembles. Superposition ensembles are, the basic, are basically this. You have a subatomic particle. Aggregate out, and you have something larger, an atom, a molecule. That's an ensemble of various superpositions for each one of those little things. You and I are superposition ensembles. It's the same idea of relative states that Hugh Everett came up with, but we can understand superposition collections or superposition ensembles. And so the planet is a large superposition ensemble. Now, physicists have a very interesting idea. Here's the electromagnetic spectrum. Basically, they don't talk about superposition ensembles. What they basically talk about is superpositions, but it's implied in the language that's common today that superposition ensembles, using my terminology, exist within the electromagnetic spectrum such that they, the frequencies that interact with us are in the visible light spectrum. For example, light enters the retina. It enters as a wave. It has certain frequencies associated with it. It hits the retina. The retina is a superposition ensemble itself. The frequencies mix with the light, with the retina, to produce a new thing, a new superposition ensemble. And that gets translated by the brain to a spot of light. So the basic implied understanding with physicists are that the superposition ensembles, if they were using those words, really only exist in realms within the, electromagnetic, within the electromagnetic spectrum that intersect with the visible spectrum. That is why long radio waves, gamma rays, x-rays, UV rays, they don't affect us, they go through us. So you, the gamma rays and x-rays, those are just light, high frequency, high energy light but they basically don't really affect us. When they come in really strong strengths, they have nonlinearities that can cause disruptions in our DNA, but generally speaking, they don't interact with us. So the point is, they're too far away. But there is theoretically nothing prohibiting the idea that you could not have aggregations of superpositions elsewhere in the electromagnetic spectrum. Other worlds elsewhere, higher up, where the frequencies are closer together, higher density. So you could have aggregations or octaves up within the electromagnetic spectrum where you have worlds, people, things like that, and we would never see them. Here we have two wave functions. The one on the right is a big one, and the one in the middle set at x equals zero is a middle one. Now look what happens when I start merging them. See how they start getting more constructive interference as they get closer? You see how it gets? Now normally people would say, of course, you move them closer, they're gonna be constructive interference. No, 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 you have it backwards. The constructive interference is what's going on. The illusion then is that they're closer or farther apart. With remote viewing, you're transferring information across infinite distances because there are no distances. There's only constructive and destructive interference processes, nothing else. So let's draw some conclusions. Everything has a wave function, including the universe. All wave functions extend throughout all of time and space. All wave functions and thus all superpositions overlap with other superpositions to some extent, including the wave function of the remote viewer. Thus, remote viewing is possible because the wave function of the remote viewer overlaps with all other things. Now, the human brain, that means, is actually a very narrow band hologram generator. That's the trick of the brain it is able to select out only the frequencies it wants you to see. If you're out there in the wilderness and you say, hey, huh, there's a lion there, you have to see that lion of today. You don't need to see the gazelle of yesterday and you don't need to see the elephant of tomorrow. You need to see the lion of today if you are going to survive. The brain has evolved to be a very narrow band hologram generator. It screens out everything else. Remote viewers are simply highly trained to expand the band to be able to see some of the other frequencies that are within their own wave function. That's why remote viewing works. Okay, that's Ingo Swan. Was he always successful? Well, most of the time. However, the degree of accuracy was related to amount of seven hertz activity over his right hemisphere. Again, the right hemisphere, the one involved with your dreaming. This is the same frequency that the entire Earth generates. His accuracy was less when there were geomagnetic storms and the Earth's magnetic field was disturbed. So if the magnetic field was disturbed, he lost the ability. When you lost the connection, you lost the ability. For example, there's an actual EEG. Back in the days, we only had three channels. Okay, notice the red arrows. Those are seven hertz. This is a unique pattern. You don't find it very often. And the number of these patterns 
were directly related to how accurate he was. So in other words, the more he showed that activity over the occipital right hemisphere, the more accurate he was in terms of the information at a distance. There's the ionosphere, and of course, generating between the Earth's surface and the ionosphere is a 7 hertz pattern. And the more you get closer to that pattern, the more you seem to have access to everything around the Earth. For example, that 7 hertz pattern not only has the same frequency as generated from the intrinsic aspect of your brain, your brain has a natural frequency. Guess what it is? 7 hertz. Based upon the fact that consciousness is recreated every 20 milliseconds, it's moving at about 4.5 meters per second. Just do a simple calculation of the circumference of your brain. It's about 7 hertz. And the intensities of both the magnetic and the electrical components for both this and your brain are identical, capable of resonance. Here we have an example, of course, from the sun to the earth. There's the earth's magnetic field. And of course, when there's a magnetic storm, you can see that you get marked perturbation and the connections are lost. Now, we're not the only species like this. For example, fish very often communicate with electrical, electrical signals, magnetic signals they generate. Thunderstorms will interfere with that connection, like having massive noise, and their behaviors are distorted. So we're not the only species. Now here are some ex examples of ordinary people drawing pictures of what they experience about a target when they are exposed to geomagnetic-like fields. In other words, is it just one people, one kind of person, or just some people? And the answer is, anybody can do it if you expose them to the field. Here is the target picture hidden in another room. This was a target picture, very much like the Ingo Swan procedure. And here's what a university student exposed to the appropriate magnetic field drew. Look at the connections. Remember, this is a situation very much like early Bell, because it's very, very scratchy at this point. But look at the essentials. Go ahead and connect them. We can see, for example, the emphasis on the shape, the eye. Remember, this is hidden in an envelope. The actual mechanical kind of individual, you can see from the outline yellow. And of course, there's always something called analytical overlay. Don't forget, this is right hemispheric. So this is all emotive and visual patterns, and it has to be translated to language. In the process of translating to language, very often you put your own verbal, how should I say it, overlay, your own, uh, your own baggage, your own verbal baggage on it, and can distort the signal, just like noise. Here's another target, hidden in another room. There's the picture, hidden in an envelope, person's never seen it. This is what the person draw if it's exposed to the appropriate configuration of magnetic field. Here's the drawing. Shall we see the connection? Take a good look. Not as sophisticated as Swan, but this is a university student with only five exposures to the procedure. Again, there's the woman in the back. All right. This fragment here, we're bl blowing it up a bit more, you can see. And finally, you can see that's purple glass written there. He's written purple glass. That entire area was purple. Now, this is not just a unique thing. This occurs repeatedly. And I'll tell you exactly what the patterns are later on. The most intense phenomena were these. When another person in another room is looking at a target and the same time, as the second person is sharing the same magnetic field, the accuracy becomes greater. So in other words, if you have one person here, one person here, you generate a condition that produces the same kind of magnetic field that influences the brain at the consciousness recreation pattern. What you'll find if whatever that person's looking at, the other person can actually draw accurately. Well, let me show you. Can the average person accept, access distant information? At Laurentian University, we developed a technology by producing a device whereby the same complex magnetic fields are shared by two people separated at a distance. When that happens, the two brains become one. Okay? So here we have the actual technology. You can see one chamber. That's what we call the octopus. It's basically eight uh, solenoids that are, produce a accelerating configuration, a second derivative magnetic field. There's what it looks like. There's the person in one room. All right, with the octopus, there's a person in the other. Here's some examples. The actual target picture that one person is looking at is on the right hand. That's, you've seen that as the bridge down here in Sudbury. 
what they're drawn, what the other person's drawing, sitting in a separate room, and you can see the actual drawing, and you can actually see the letters or the words up there, and we've amplified them for you. Motion, bright long, vertical lines, wormhole, crowd, flower, explosion, passing stuff moving through. The essential aspects of that hidden target have been extracted and now are being shared by the two different people who share the same magnetic field. Their brains, both those brains are now effectively one. But the effect extends experience. If both people separated by distance share the same configuration of magnetic field, a light flash, just a light flash, to one person affects the brain activity of the other sitting in the dark in another room. So what we found is that we can connect it to actual light. All right? The photon emission energy from the brain while a person is sitting in the dark is about 10,000 times less than the stars on a cloudy night, but we can measure it with photomultiplier tubes. However, it's 100 times more intense than the energy from the cosmic rays that pervade the universe. Now, I know you're thinking that this is really, really weak, but let me do an experiment real quick. Okay. Effectively, you're listening to me right now. And the sounds you're hearing are in the order of about a millipascal in terms of pressure. That's what you're listening. About 40 to 50 decibels, a millipascal. And presumably you're listening to me. Right now, above you, there's over 100 kilopascals of pressure. A billion times more pressure on your body right now than the pressure associated with me talking with you and you listening. Can you hear the atmosphere? It's a billion times more. Of course you can't. It's not the intensity. It's the pattern. The pattern is the critical thing. So never underestimate the importance of the pattern. It's not the intensity. And furthermore, if we take something like this, like one of these nice little cinnamon, and I drop it just like that. I dropped it this way. That's about a microjoule of energy. Now, for you to see a light in the dark, that only takes about 10 to the minus 17th joules. That's a decimal point followed by 16 zeros and a 1, which means this is a microjoule, which means that energy from dropping that right now would be enough to light up every eye of every human being on this planet. The critical thing is the energy and the pattern that detects it. Never think bigness is important. So, here's what happens. If, for example, we have one person in one room having a flashing light, another person in another room completely in the dark, completely in the dark, and they only share the magnetic field, a special kind of configurational magnetic field that produces a synthetic consciousness, making both brains the same, when there is no flash in the other room, this person has theirs on the left. That's what's coming off the side of their head. If the person in the other room is seeing a flashing light, an ordinary dull flashing light, the person sitting in the dark, their brain also generates light because they're connected, even at a distance. That's right. And now we know in neuroscience that it's very likely, Bokan and other people have actually shown this, that there's light emission from retina, that when you're actually thinking, about white light, there's just not action potentials and neurons firing, there's actually photons being emitted within your brain. Right? Actual photons, and we can measure them. The minute you have photons, you have access to almost everything. Right? Now when there are photons involved, the phenomenon of entanglement becomes real. This means that what happens to one person is reflected in another regardless of space or time. Here's a uh, an animation of what we're talking about, that's entanglement. In other words, entanglement means that effectively, the minute you have two people connected, <coughs> photons here and photons here, we really don't know right now when that photon is flashing in the other room, is it the same photon that shows up in the other person's brain instantaneously, or there's simply entanglement. But if you have entanglement, 
you understand what that means. That means you have information at a distance. You change something here, you change something here instantaneous. Already physicists are doing this. They call it teleportation because they're a bit more dramatic. <laughs> All right. But in actual fact, they've already done it, up to over 100 kilometers. Change, this, change the polarity on one, the other one changes instantaneously. That's the first stage to having information from everywhere. Right. Now, if one has the technology and access the appropriate pattern shared by other brains, information can be accessed. We can amplify, concentrate, and control what has been happening only occasionally for centuries. Now, think about it. Like watching lightning. We did it for thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years as a species. And then we mastered electricity. Look at the difference. We watched birds fly, wondering what it would be like. We never did have wings, we never developed them, but we, now we can fly, we call it an airplane. If you can imagine it, it can be done. And that's why, because the brain is matter. It's based upon the physical principles of the universe. And if you have that capacity to imagine it, that means the potential is there for it to be done. Because our brains are reflective of the es essential aspects of the matter of this universe. Now, Sean Harabans, a classic example of extraction of information. This is the man who knows your memory. There's uh, Dr. Webster actually extracting some, uh, some blood and actually injecting some radioactive material into Mr. Harabans. We were the first to demonstrate that when he is engaging in reading another person's memory, it's not all hocus pocus. What really happens? A part of his brain that's been different from the time he was born shows an increase in activity as measured by single photon emission computerized tomography. Very specific to the right parietal lobe. Here's Sean Harabance, again an animation. He's looking at a picture. All he has to do is look at a picture of the person about whom he's talking, and he begins to talk about the person's past, often embarrassing things that only they know. How can that be done unless you have access to memory? Right? It's not written anywhere. We made an extraordinary discovery about Harabance's brain. The energy associated when we measured, don't forget, the experiment, the most powerful tool we've got. You can speculate until you get extraordinarily enthusiastic to the point of uh, inebriation, but unless you've got the experiment, you don't know. So we've actually did experiments. We brought him up here. We measured him repeatedly. Okay. We made an extraordinary discovery about Harabance's brain, the energy associated with the small decrease in the Earth's magnetic field around his right hemisphere. We were flabbergasted when we put our magnetometers around his head. His brain actually distorts the local magnetic field. Small amounts, but measurable and reliable. Okay. It was equal to the energy of the light emission from his brain. You think that light emission was interesting. You should have seen the photomultiplier tubes when we put it around his head. The needles are visibly showing increases in activity. And the more the photons increase, the more the magnetic field dropped. And that energy was equal to the activity of the neurons. We actually calculated the number of neurons that he was uh, showing activity by looking at our quantitative EEG. In other words, conservation of energy. The longer Mr. Harabance was close to the subject, the more the subject's brain began to show the patterns of Harabance's brain. Let me give you an example. Harabance and the subject. This is our EEG, okay, single channel. Obviously, we do 1020, okay. But notice that as he sits there, they become more and more synchronous. At that point, when they become synchronous, he actually begins to extract information and begins to tell information to the other person, the person sitting there information that is only they know about. We think his brain became connected with the brains of the people nearby through the Earth's magnetic field. Something like this. It seems to only work when he's close. Okay? So as he gets closer and closer, and we see it, we did it repeatedly, time after time, the more they're close to Harabans, the more their EEG activity became like his. And we suspect that what happens is he began to extract information. I'll tell you, show you how in a second. During the connection, there was enhanced brain power at 7 hertz over his right hemisphere. You can see the red arrow. That refers to specifically the 7 hertz band coming off his brain. Remember the 7 hertz intrinsic pattern to the Earth itself. 
the same pattern that Swan had, and seems to be something fundamental. Now, the seven hertz is tied to something called the hippocampus, the gateway to memory. And if you access that, you access all the information that's being consolidated in your experience. Remember, your memories are nothing more than synaptic patterns. That's all they really are. And the gateway to that is the hippocampus. Is there another homogeneous field to which all of us are exposed? All right. There are the communication systems of the web, internet, and the massive electromagnetic matrix that it creates. I'm just giving you one. There's others you know. Let's take a good look at it. That's sort of a, a diagram of it. You can see that effectively right now communication systems are so pervasive that we all are immersed in this background that we call communication systems. You know, interesting thing. At one time we used to have to have radar sent out and reflected back in order to see things at a distance. Now the electromagnetic density of all the communication systems are so great they generate a shadow we don't even have to generate radar emission anymore. We're living within the shadow, quite literally, of a massive electromagnetic field generated by communication systems, which means, means we're immersed, all of us, in a homogeneous secondary field called the communication system, called the modern technology. And much of it is pulsed, very much within the range of the brain, the human brain. So I ask you this question, what would it mean if you and everyone else had access to the information of every other brain on this planet? You should think about that for a second. In fact, I'll repeat it. What would happen, or what would it mean if you and every, everyone else had access to the information of every other brain on this planet? So there's seven billion of us roughly. What would happen? First of all, knowledge is the ultimate power. And as you know, revolutions occur when about 50%, and this is historical, when about 50% of the population becomes educated, that's when you have revolutions, historically. Okay? When they become literate. That's why people are often, and dictators are often against literacy or access to free information. But what would happen? Knowledge is the ultimate power. First of all, the control of populations is based upon a few having discretionary information over the many call them governments sometimes. Economic advantage derives from proprietary information. If everybody had equal access and knew what the other person was thinking, do you think there'd be rich people? I think there'd be poor people. And finally, the success of governments depends upon sequestered facts. Do you really think governments could have their power that they have right now if you knew everything they were doing? Of course not. After six million years of boredom, the uh, evolutionary uh, ascent of our species from the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee, something extraordinary happened to us less than 100,000 years ago, which, by the way, is long after we'd become anatomically modern. Um, it was a kind of uh, emergence into, into consciousness less than 100,000 years ago, really less than 40,000 years ago, when we became fully symbolic uh, creatures. And this uh, great change has been de defined as the single most important step forward in the evolution of human behavior is intimately associated with the emergence of the great and transcendent rock and cave art all around the world. And uh, over the last 30 years, uh, researchers led by Professor David Lewis Williams at the University of Witwatersrand uh, in South Africa and, and, and many others have suggested an, an intriguing and, and radical possibility, which is that this emergence into consciousness was triggered by our ancestors' encounters with visionary plants and the beginning of shamanism. Uh, if you analyze the cave art, it's, there's not time to go into the details here, but there are so many details that make it clear that this was an art of altered states of consciousness, of, of, of visions. Um, and and uh, that plants like the Amanita muscaria mushroom or psilocybin mushrooms appear to have been directly connected with this uh, sudden 
and radical change. So to investigate this, this possibility, when I got interested in this mystery, I went down to the Amazon, where there are still surviving shamanistic cultures today, and where they drink the powerful visionary brew ayahuasca, of which the active ingredient is dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is actually closely related at the molecular level uh, to psilocybin. Now, normally, DMT uh, cannot be activated orally. When we encounter it in the West, it's generally smoked. There's an enzyme in our stomachs called monoamine oxidase, which switches off uh, DMT uh, on, on contact. Uh, but in the Amazon, they've got round this problem, and they say it was the spirits that taught them how to do it. The DMT in the ayahuasca brew is contained in these leaves from a plant that they call chacruna uh, in the Amazon. And there they mix it together with this vine. And out of the 150,000 different species of plants and trees in the Amazon, this is the one that contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which switches off that enzyme in our stomachs and allows the DMT in the leaves, when the two are married together and cooked in water, to be absorbed orally and takes us on a, a four-hour uh, journey into extraordinary realms. DMT is um, the most interesting in some ways of the psychedelics because more issues are raised by it than any other. DMT is the strongest hallucinogen there is. If it's, if it's possible to get more loaded than, than that, I don't want to know about it. Another very interesting thing about DMT is it occurs naturally in the human brain. Well, now, what's going on here? He's saying the strongest drug, the fastest drug, is the most natural drug. Sometimes people say, uh, is DMT dangerous? It sounds so crazy. Is it dangerous? The answer is only if you fear death by astonishment. And the, this death by astonishment thing, uh, well, one thing about it, I mean, let me say a little bit more about it. One thing that endears DMT to me is I like to say it doesn't affect your mind. It doesn't seem to affect your mind. In other words, uh, you don't change under the influence of DMT. You don't become a kinder, gentler person. You don't sink into, you know, a line of drool from one corner of your mouth as you sit there twitching. You don't change. What happens is the world is completely replaced instantly 100 percent it's all gone and what is put in its place not one iota of what is put in its place was taken from this world so it's a 100 percent reality channel switch they don't even retain three-dimensional space and linear time. It's not like you go to an exotic place, Morocco or New Guinea. It's like you, uh, reality is swapped out for something else. And when you try to say what it is, you realize that language has evolved in this world and it can serve no other. In, or it must it takes years of practice so what you're looking at is literally the unspeakable the indescribable falls into your lap two large tokes away at any given time is this non-euclidean non-newtonian irrational un-englishable place but it's not smooth and empty and clear. That's not what gives it its indescribability. What gives it its indescribability is its utter weirdness, its alienness, its power to astonish. Now, it's uh, no joke to drink ayahuasca. The ayahuasca brew um, it has, a, has a foul, uh, foul taste, <laughs> really, really hideous and a dreadful, dreadful smell. 
Um, and, and after you've drunk your cup, you'll find within 45 minutes or so that you're sweating, that you're feeling nauseous. Pretty soon you may well be vomiting, you may well have diarrhea. So, you know, nobody's doing this for recreation. Um, and, and, and I'd like to add that I don't think any of the psychedelics should be used for recreation. They have much more serious and important mission with, uh, with, with humanity. Um, so, we're not doing this for fun. But what draws people to ayahuasca again and again to brace themselves for this experience, and you do have to brace yourself, is its extraordinary effects at the level of consciousness. And one of those effects has to do with creativity, and we can see the creative cosmogenic impulse of ayahuasca in the paintings of ayahuasca shamans from Peru, like the paintings of Pablo Amaringo here, those richly saturated colors, the, the amazing visions that they, that they reproduce. Um, and, and, and this creative impulse has also spread to Western, uh, Western artists. Many Western artists now have been deeply influenced by ayahuasca and are also painting their visions. Uh, and, and as these paintings show, another universal experience of ayahuasca is the encounter with seemingly intelligent entities which communicate with us telepathically. Now, I'm making no claim one way or another as to the reality status of these entities we encounter. Simply that phenomenologically, in the ayahuasca experience, they are encountered by people all over the world. And most frequently of all, the uh, spirit of ayahuasca uh, herself, Mother, Mother Ayahuasca, uh, who is a, is a healer. And although she's kind of the mother goddess of the planet, she seems to take a direct personal interest in us as individuals, uh, to heal our ills, to want us to be the best that we can possibly be, to correct errors and mistakes in our behavior that may be leading us down the wrong path. And, you know, that leads me to ask, what is death? Our materialist science reduces everything to matter. Materialist science in the West says that we are just meat, we're just our bodies. So when the brain is dead, that's the end of consciousness. There is no life after death. There is no soul. We just rot and are, and are gone. But actually, many honest scientists should admit that consciousness is the greatest mystery of science and, and that we don't know exactly how it works. The brain's involved in it in some way, but we're not sure how. Could be that the brain generates consciousness the way a generator makes electricity. If you hold to that paradigm, then, then of course you can't believe in life after death. When the generator is broken, consciousness is gone. But it's equally possible that the relationship, and nothing in neuroscience rules it out, that the relationship is more like the relationship of the TV signal to the TV set. And in that case, when the TV set is broken, of course, the TV signal continues. And this is uh, the paradigm of all spiritual uh, traditions, that we are immortal souls temporarily incarnated in these physical forms to learn and to grow and to, uh, and to develop. And really, if we want to know about this mystery, the last people we should ask are materialist reductionist scientists. They have nothing to say on the matter at all. Let's go rather to the ancient Egyptians who put their best minds to work for 3,000 years on the problem of death and on the problem of how we should live our lives to prepare for what we will confront after death. And the ancient Egyptians expressed their ideas in transcendent art, which still touches us emotionally today, and they came to certain very specific conclusions that the soul does survive death, and that we will be held accountable for every thought, every action, every deed that we have lived through in our, in our lives. So we'd better take this precious opportunity to be born in a human body seriously and make the most of it. And in these inquiries into the mystery of death, the ancient Egyptians weren't just exercising their imaginations. They highly valued dream states, and it's now known that they used visionary plants like the, the hallucinogenic blue water lily. Uh, and it's interesting that the ancient Egyptian tree of life has recently been identified as the Acacia nilotica, which contains high quantities of DMT, dimethyltryptamine, the same active ingredient that we find in ayahuasca. Now, it's difficult to imagine a society more different from the society of ancient Egypt than our society today. We hate visionary states in this society. In our society, if we want to insult somebody, we call them a dreamer. In ancient societies, that was praise. And we have erected huge apparatuses of armed bureaucracies who will invade our privacy, who will break down our doors, who will arrest us, who will send us to prison, sometimes for years. 
for possessing even small quantities of psilocybin or substances like uh, DMT, whether in its smokable form or, or, or in the ayahuasca brew. And yet, ironically, DMT is, as we now know, a natural brain hormone. We all have it in our, in our bodies, and it's just that its function remains unknown for, for lack of research. And it's not as though our society is opposed in principle to altered states of consciousness. I mean, billions are being made by the unholy alliance of psycho, psych, psychiatrists and, and big pharma in over-prescribing uh, drugs to control so-called syndromes like uh, depression or attention deficit disorder uh, in, in uh, teenagers. Um, and we have a, a love affair in our society with alcohol. We, we glorify this most boring of drugs, uh, despite the, <laughs> the, the, the terrible uh, consequences that it often has. And of course, we love our stimulants, our tea, our coffee, our energy drinks, our sugar, and, and, and huge industries are, are built around these, these, uh, these substances, which are valued because of the way they alter consciousness. But what all these approved altered states of consciousness have in common is that none of them contradict or conflict with the basic state of consciousness valued by our society, which I would call the alert problem-solving state of consciousness, which is good for the more mundane aspects of science. It's good for the prosecution of warfare. It's good for commerce. It's good for politics. But I think everybody realizes that the promise of a society over-monopolistically based upon this state of consciousness has proved hollow and that this model is no longer working, that it's broken in every possible sense that a model can be broken, and that urgently we need to find something to replace it. The vast problems of global pollution that have resulted from the single-minded pursuit of, of profit, the, the horrors of, of nuclear proliferation, the specter of, of, of hunger that millions every night go to bed starving, that we can't even solve this problem despite our alert, problem-solving state of consciousness. And look what's happening in the Amazon, the lungs of our planet, this precious home of biodiversity. The old-growth rainforest being cut down and replaced with soya bean farms so we can feed cattle so that we can all eat hamburgers. Only a truly insane global state of consciousness could allow such an abomination to occur. And I did a back-of-an-envelope calculation during the Iraq War, it seems to me that six months' expenditure on the Iraq war would have solved the problem of the Amazon forever, would be sufficient to compensate the peoples of the Amazon so that no single tree ever needed to be cut down again to garden and, and look after that amazing resource. But we can't make that decision as a global community. We can spend countless billions on warfare, on hatred, on fear, on suspicion, on division, but we can't get the, together the collective effort to save the lungs of our planet. And this is perhaps why shamans from the Amazon are now mounting a kind of reverse missionary activity. When I've asked shamans about the sickness of the West, they say it's quite simple. You guys have severed your connection with spirit. Unless you reconnect with spirit and do so soon, you're going to bring the whole house of cards down around your heads and ours. And rightly or wrongly, they believe that ayahuasca is the remedy for that sickness. And many now are being called to the Amazon to drink ayahuasca, and ayahuasca shamans are traveling throughout the West, offering the brew, often under the radar, often at personal risk, uh, to bring about consciousness change. And it's true that the message of ayahuasca, the universal message, is about the sacred, magical, enchanted, infinitely precious nature of life on Earth and the interdependence of material and spiritual realms. And it's impossible to work with ayahuasca for long without being deeply and profoundly affected by this message. And let's not forget that ayahuasca is not alone, that it's part of an ancient worldwide system of the targeted, careful, responsible alteration of consciousness. Uh, it's recently been, been shown by scholars that the kaikion used in the Eleus Eleusinian mysteries in, in ancient Greece was almost certainly a, a psychedelic brew, that the soma of the Vedas may well have been a brew based upon the Amanita muscaria mushroom. We have the DMT in the ancient Egyptian a tree of life. We have the whole global cultures of surviving shamanism, and what it's all about is a state of consciousness that's designed to help us find balance, harmony. The ancient Egyptians would have called it mat with the, with the universe, and to remain mindful that what we're here to undertake on Earth while immersed in matter is fundamentally a spiritual journey aimed at the, the growth and perfection of the soul, a journey that may go back to the very origins of what made us human 
in the first place. And I stand here invoking the hard-won right of freedom of speech to call for and demand another right to be recognized, and that is the right of adult sovereignty over consciousness. There's a war on consciousness in our society, and if we as adults are not allowed to make sovereign decisions about what to experience with our own consciousness while doing no harm to others, including the decision to use responsibly ancient and sacred visionary plants, then we cannot claim to be free in any way. And it's useless for our society to go around the world imposing our form of democracy on others while we nourish this rot at the heart of society and we do not allow individual freedom over consciousness. It may even be that we're denying ourselves the next vital step in our own evolution by allowing this state of affairs to continue and who knows, perhaps our immortal destiny as well.